As we continue to swallow this bitter fruit that the majority conservative justices have forced down our throats today, I want to read you one tweet that spoke to me from historian, writer, and friend of the show, Michael Harriet. He wrote, the Supreme Court did not strike down affirmative action. Admission preferences for legacies, donors, employee families, and special recommendations are all still allowed. The court struck down affirmative action for everyone except white people. To his point, prior to today, Harvard has described race as a potential tip or plus factor, along with whether one of the student's parents graduated from the undergraduate college, whether a student comes from a low-income family, and whether a student has special athletic talent. After today, the only tips that remain are legacy, low income, and special athletic talent. Joining me now are Andrew Brennan, a 2019 graduate of the University of North Carolina, who was a party to the affirmative action case involving that university. Angie Gabo, president of the Harvard Black Students Association. And Michael Eric Dyson, professor of African American and Diaspora Studies at Vanderbilt University and co-author of Unequal. A story of America, apropos on today. I do want to start here at the table with you, Angie. Um, we were just having the whole Harvard House conversation, <laughs> but we're going to have a conversation that's more serious now. When I was at Harvard, there were a lot of legacies. There were a lot of people there who didn't get in because they had great grades. They got in because, you know, they mama and daddy, grandparents' name might be one of those exactly. buildings. <laughs> those people can still get in. Their affirmative action seems quite in place. Mm. What do you make of that? No, I totally agree. That's still true today. Um, there's also, like, you know, we've seen it um, in other cases, like the back door, the side door, mm -hmm. um, other ways to get into Harvard. Um, but they just struck it down just for black students and black and brown students um, on campus to be able to have um, specific access due to, like, disadvantages in yeah. specific circumstances. And when I was there, the, one of the other experiences I had is that the so-called affirmative action kids were some of the most brilliant people I've ever met. They all worked really hard in school, mm -hmm. were super nerds. I mean, Gatanji Brown Jackson was there when I was there. Right. Okay, this is a brilliant human being. Exactly. And they were hardworking. The very, very well-off, you know, very affluent kids didn't have to work as hard. They had it set no matter what happened to them. And so I wonder what you make of the fact that this court seems to think that choosing students like you is an affront to the Constitution. No, it's, it's really crazy. Cons at least in my experience, I really found that my race is my identity. All the stories that I've told Harvard, which is the reason I got in, um, were directly correlated with my race because I live as a black woman every single day. Um, and a lot of my peers um, and counterparts that are also black, like I get to hear their amazing stories and what they get to do um, every day that you just need in a school like Harvard. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. Andrew, let, you uh, testified, I think, in one of the lower court cases. Um, I would love to know what you make of the decision and how you think it will change the university um, from which you graduated if people cannot freely, the university cannot freely choose students like you. Thanks, Joy. Yeah, you know, when I, I think it's important to remember the context at UNC in which this decision has been made. Uh, when I was a student at UNC, the school was 11% black in a state that was 22% black. Uh, you know, Joy, I had grown up my entire life in the South, uh, but it wasn't until my time at UNC uh, did I see my first and second Confederate rallies on campus. Uh, and so it's within that context uh, that this lawsuit was brought. Uh, and I think it speaks to uh, how absurd it is uh, that this is not uh, a compelling interest uh, to ensure diversity on our college campuses. We share that. I saw my first Confederate flag at Harvard as well. Someone unfurled it very large so, and was, so that when those of us who are black had to walk beneath it as we went to the library. Fun times. Uh, uh, Michael Eric Dyson, you have taught at many PWIs, at many very prominent uh, in majority white universities. How do you think these universities, in your experience and the way that they try to recruit students, will react to this decision? Well, Joy, I taught at Chapel Hill for three years. Um, you know, I, I think that, look, the left has to have a long game and strategy like the right does. They've been laying in wait for 50 years to try to figure out Roe versus Wade, and they worked on it. And we got to understand and underscore, before I directly answer your question, why voting matters. Because yes. Donald Trump not in office means that three Supreme Court justices that he appointed would not have been appointed, and Hillary Clinton instead would have appointed them. So voting continues to matter. I think that schools have the wide latitude and the ability to count race as merit, right? So when we have a notion of merit, merit is not an abstract good, right? Uh, if you're in a boxing ring, it's meritorious to strike out and hurt somebody. If you're in your home, it's called domestic violence. The same act, 
Or when they said you can consider race, uh, I mean, race was considered in terms of harming black people, but not to heal them. Well, the same intrusion that a bullet makes in the body, a surgeon makes to remove it. So it can't be that race is the problem in terms of removing the hurt and bringing healing about as it was in terms of intending harm. This kind of gobbledygook and malfeasance and ledger domain by the Supreme Court justices is utterly ridiculous. White folk get the hook up, black folk get the hook. So what yeah. we have to do is to understand that we have to continue to strategize like we did before there was affirmative action so we can have a long plan. Schools can still consider race, among many other factors, you can't stop a school from saying diversity is in critical, incredibly important and name that diversity in ways that obscure the racial dimension right. for strategic purposes. Let, let me go quickly ask you what you make of Clarence Thomas's concurrence. Yeah, that is a shameful manifestation of a lethal and malignant black self-hatred that continues to express itself in the derision that he holds black people. This is an unfortunate and remarkable situation where a black man who used affirmative action, because his mediocrity is not a secret. He barely speaks in the Supreme Court. His inarticulate vows continue to manifest an intelligence that is quite markedly uh, inferior, and yet he has the ability and the power to kill black people metaphorically by lifting up the very ladder that he used to get up on affirmative action. Yeah. This is so foul and nefarious in so many ways. And Andrew, I'll ask you the same thing. What did you make of the fact that the first, uh, the, the second to black Supreme Court justice uh, gleefully uh, saw the end of affirmative action, which he has been trying to do for a long time? I, I think it's a real shame. Um, and as Justice Sotomayor pointed out in her dissent, uh, because of today's decision, uh, the police can consider my race when assessing uh, suspicion of a crime. Uh, but a college admissions officer uh, can't consider my race uh, when assessing uh, the potential contributions that I could make to a college campus. Yeah. I think it's that sort of tortured logic uh, that makes uh, no sense. And it's not just black people that are harmed by this, Joy. Yeah, uh, absolutely. Having diverse college campuses benefit black and white students of all, all races uh, benefit. So that's what In we're losing. Indeed. And I'm going to give you the last word here. What advice would you give uh, the next you who's applying to Harvard in this environment? I would say hold out hope. Um, I was outside the Supreme Court today, and there's a lot of people who are rallying. Um, and also take action. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of people will, you know, say that they feel uncomfortable or they feel disappointed by this decision. Yeah. But we, that also has to come with action. That also has to come with, you know, community building, community Amen. organizing. And I would give one piece of advice to everybody who is unhappy with the Supreme Court, vote and vote all the way down the ballot because it is the United States Senate who confirms Supreme Court justices and it's who you pick for president that's going to decide who gets nominated. You've got to vote. Don't leave it to people who like Donald Trump. Uh, Andrew Brennan, Angie Gabo, Michael Eric Dyson, thank you all very much.